when, when I was in, uh, interviewed for the post of environmental microbiologist as a lecturing post here at Imperial College in 1997, having worked at the Water Research Centre for oh, nine years, um, I was asked, well, you know, what is horticulture and you know, how, what, will, how will, what will that bring to your role here in a civil engineering department? And um, I was actually ready for that question. And, um, and basically it's because horticulture is about understanding and controlling the environment. Um, understanding the behaviour of soils, the behaviour of waste materials, the impacts of, of temperature and, and moisture content. And, and all of these environmental variables that sort of influence um, uh, the, the way that bioresources or organic waste materials actually behave in terms of deriving benefit from these things in terms of fertilizer value and these other types of properties. So um, I, I feel quite comfortable being an applied scientist, you know, making a contribution in a, a department where I'm working with civil engineers. And, and I think it's, um, a, 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 it's been a very rewarding and, and stimulating environment to be in. And um, what, uh, you know, what the, the task that I've really got to do this evening really is to try and summarise what has effectively been 30 years of research in bioresources into, into 50 minutes. And, and in fact, I started work in the bioresource, the organic waste area, in 1982. And um, I've been working in this area ever since. So, you know, over that time I've developed a very broad uh, range of, of, of expertise, largely linked with industry. It's been very much an applied type of career. It's taken me all over the world. I've worked at different scales, from home composting to you know, large-scale treatment processes. And I'm hoping to give you a flavour of, of some of, of uh, that experience um, uh, this evening. Um, when I was thinking of the title for this uh, talk, actually, you, you know, when, you, when you're putting together an inaugural lecture, it is, a, it is an opportunity to reflect on what your contribution has been over the years. And I thought, well, actually, what have I been doing over the past 30 years? What is it? What, what am I going to tell my friends and family and, and colleagues? Uh, uh, how can I explain that? And uh, basically, I didn't realise when I set out on my career in 1982 investigating the, uh, uh, the application and the, the benefits of, of organic materials in the environment that, that these would become, if they're not already, sort of... P pillars of sustainable development in terms of recycling nutrients back into the food chain to complete nutrient cycles and, um, uh, and, and to, to ensure food security for the UK and, and Europe and elsewhere uh, and also to provide um, car carbon and energy sources um, uh, the, the sort of intrinsic calorific value that's tied up in these materials. You can recover value in terms of, of energy and recycle the materials that way. And again, you know, energy recovery and um, is, is en energy value and uh, renewable energy sources is sort of intimately linked with sustainable development. So, so I think what I do is really important and I enjoy it a lot and I'm hoping to share that with you um, this evening. Bioresources, uh, in this context, I'm referring to organic waste materials. There may be liquid wastes, there may be solid wastes, and they're generated by a whole range of processes, which at some point or, or other have been food, largely speaking, or, or biomass, uh, material that's grown on soil, and um, it's, it's been used for a certain purpose, and, and then is uh, potentially discarded. And uh, those materials have intrinsic value locked in them in terms of the nutrients that they absorbed when they grew and the carbon they fixed from the atmosphere in terms of uh, carbon dioxide and photosynthesis. So even sewage sludge, which is the byproduct of wastewater treatment, contains organic material derived from food and um, is generated from the faeces that we excrete and uh, is collected and treated at wastewater treatment works. But livestock, uh, industrial wastes and, 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 and commercial municipal waste are all sources of these materials. 
it's difficult always to get figures, but just to give you a feel, I, I reckon there's somewhere between 100 million and 120 million tonnes of these materials produced each year in the UK. Sewage sludge uh, receives, you know, it's a very, um, receives a lot of attention. It's quite a controversial material, um, and, um, but it's a very valuable resource of nutrients. Livestock manures is the main contributor, about 90 million tonnes of um, managed manures. Compost materials, this is a very interesting story because when I started work here at Imperial in the uh, late 90s, there was really no composting industry in the UK. We composted perhaps 100,000 or 200,000 tonnes of material. Today we're composting 5 million tonnes of material, producing 3 million tonnes of compost. This is a very dynamic sector, so any students in the audience, um, you know, if you're thinking of going into a, uh, the, the waste sector for a career, this is a very exciting and dynamic industry to be in. <coughs> Industrial bio-waste is another source of materials, and, and food waste. We, in, in this country, we waste about 20 million tonnes of food waste. This all goes in the landfill. Uh, it's high, highly biodegradable. It's generating methane that contributes to climate change. But this is a valuable resource, and we need to be recovering that material and recycling it to land and recovering energy from it. So in terms of bioresources management, um, landfill disposal has been a traditional route for disposal of these materials. But uh, there is, it's under pressure, there is reg leg legislation to diminish uh, the, bar, the, the disposal of biodegradable wastes through this route from, from Europe, which is implemented in the UK. So this is really regarded as, a, uh, as, as an approach which is no longer sustainable, although, as I said, we are still disposing of very significant amounts of these valuable resources in landfill. We need to do something about it. The two things you can do are recycle it to land, take benefit from the nutrients, or recover energy from it. And there are a variety of means of doing that. And the area that I'm particularly keen on is to produce, uh, use a microbial process to dry the material to produce a solid fuel that can then enter an uh, advanced digestion process called pyrolysis and gasification, which um, uh, is, is a process that um, thermally decomposes waste to produce a carb concentrated carbon byproduct and, uh, and a high hydrogen concentration gas, which has a high calorific value. But the process requires a, a consistent feedstock, which has got a low moisture. So I think that the linking of these two processes together could have a, a lot of advantages in, in the future. Uh, incineration is another opportunity, but this can really only be successful at a very large scale, whereas this type of approach, the solid fuel and... Uh, pyrolysis approach could be applied at smaller and medium sized scales, so it provides a lot more flexibility. Wastewater treatment, um, we're all very fortunate in this room in benefiting from the work that the Victorian engineers did in developing our understanding of wastewater treatment technologies. And um, uh, when you think around the globe, um, there, there are about two billion people who don't have access to uh, 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 s proper sanitation conditions. And these individuals are exposed to uh, uh, enteric diseases and pathogens um, are, are of the order of, uh, th say, 30% of the population are infected with enteric uh, helminth worms as a result of a la the lack of these services in many parts of the world. So in the UK and in developed countries, we're very fortunate to have these uh, facilities available to us. The wastewater treatment process is a purification process. Um, it transfers the polluting load in the raw sewage into a material, into a byproduct sewage sludge, so that the effluent can be discharged safely to the environment. Now, that sewage sludge, and this is a material that I've worked on very extensively over the years, um, it is a hazardous material, potentially. Uh, it can be odorous, it can contain elevated concentrations of pathogens and uh, other uh, contaminant materials. So it's important to manage it in a safe and sustainable way uh, in order to derive value from it. And the research that I've done and colleagues have done at WRC and other institutions has, has provided that scientific basis in order to facilitate that. So there are a range of treatment processes that can be applied to make this material safe so it can be used in different applications. And the benefits 
from sewage sludge and these other bioresources include the, the nutrients, organic matter enables fertiliser replacement, but there are some concerns about pathogens and metals, and I'll be talking about pathogens and metals specifically, and, and there are other concerns as well, but I don't have time to, uh, to deal with those this afternoon. <clears throat> I think the trends in uh, sewage sludge production are particularly interesting. Um, and uh, for many years, the uh, total sludge production in the UK sort of was bouncing around about a million tonnes or so. And about 50% 50, 50 of this, so about uh, four, 450,000 tonnes, were being recycled to land. So about 50, 55%. But in the late 90s, the amount of sludge increased very, very significantly in, re in response to environmental legislation, which tightened the discharge standards from sewage treatment works. And uh, as soon as you increase the uh, uh, environmental quality of the effluent, that means you generate significantly more sewage sludge in the process. And so we're now looking at a total production of about 1.4 million tonnes. And over 70% of that is now recycled to land. So it's been an increase in relative and absolute terms. And um, I think in part... It's not the complete explanation, but in part, this is, has been due to the research that the water industry and the UK government has invested in supporting the agricultural route to a large degree. Um, so that's a very positive situation. I have to say that the amount of investment that's going into research in this area currently, is, uh, given the importance of this outlet, is really um, uh, insufficient to support... Um, this increasing, importantly increasing sector. So, you know, a plea is, you know, we do need to, in order to maintain and progress this area, we do need to continue with uh, research funding in order to provide that support so we can continue this sustainable track. <clears throat> this is a very poignant and important um, uh, slide in terms of uh, global phosphate production. It's, it's in, in my view and the view of others that uh, we're really approaching a crisis in the agriculture and, and agricultural production and food production sector. And that's going to hit us pretty soon. And I think this is going to be much bigger than the, uh, the climate change and, and carbon issues that we're all very occupied with at the moment. Within 25 years, peak phosphate production is expected to uh, uh, arrive. And there are parallels here with peak oil production a number of years ago. Uh, increased costs, uh, increased uncertainty about uh, the security of energy sources, and all of these types of problems linked with uh, this situation. And I, and I think this is going to raise the cost of agricultural production. Um, food costs are going to increase globally. It's going to put uh, a very significant stress on the agricultural sector. And here we have materials which have phosphate and other nutrients embedded within them that were used to produce the food in the first place, to me it makes absolute sense that we should be returning these materials back to the land for food production in order to complete these nutrient cycles. And I think within a few years, uh, wastewater treatment plants will be seen as fertiliser factories rather than as, as waste production uh, sites. And, um, and I think it will also be compulsory to install nutrient removal at these wastewater treatment works because you can greatly increase the efficiency of nutrient capture almost to 100% in the case of phosphate at wastewater treatment plants. I think we should be doing that. We should be acting on this now, not waiting for 25 years because that will be too late. So I think there's a really important sort of serious message uh, to, to, uh, to take from this. Now you might think that this is a field of cabbages and uh, you'd be right, but this is actually a field experiment that uh, I put together, I set up in 1983 when I was doing my PhD. And uh, est to, to estimate the nutrient value from uh, biosolids products, from uh, treated sewage sludge materials. During the PhD, I've developed some novel experimental designs, uh, novel analytical apparatus for measuring nutrient concentrations in crops and uh, in soils. And here you can see this is a uh, gradient of, of uh, activated sludge or sewage sludge application across the plot. And you can see there's a gradient of yield increase. 
Now, this is a, the, the way the plot appears in the field, but you can use numerical techniques and coupled with uh, chemical analysis methods to derive a lot of information about the nutrient value of materials in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients and their release from the patterns of these responses and comparing different materials and fertiliser materials together. So yes, this is a field of cabbages, but actually it's a bioassay of uh, nutrient bioavailability and it's this information that underpins the nutrient value recommendations. The first major uh, contract that I uh, received while I was here at Imperial was to do this for a range of uh, biosolids materials. Um, in, in the mid-90s, the water industry uh, was reclassifying its microbiological standards for biosolids, and uh, the industry was expanding the range of types of treatment processes that it was operating. So for the first time, we saw a whole range of new processes that changed the physical chemical properties of different biosolids uh, products. And um, so it meant that we really needed to redefine the nutrient value of these materials to provide uh, comprehensive advice to farmers who are using the materials, to advisors and the industry so that the materials could be used efficiently so that farmers uh, got the response that it said on the tin so they had the confidence that these materials deliver um, consistently uh, but at the same time that we weren't causing problems in terms of excessive nutrient availability and its impacts on the environment from impacting the, uh, the water environment from leaching processes and this sort of thing. Um, basically we used the same systematic approaches that I developed uh, when we were uh, in, in, at Reading so there's a direct link between horticulture and, and public health engineering aspects of civil engineering. This is the uh, systematic uh, plots here. You can see the increase in gradient. And we tested a whole, all of the main biosolids types that were being produced then and currently. And then you compare the uh, response of the biosolids. This is DMAD. This is a dewatered, mesophilic, anaerobically digested material, which is actually a main product produced by the water industry. It's anaerobically digested material. Another byproduct of that process is biogas, so it's a very popular process in terms of both renewable energy and capturing nutrients. And then you, cap you compare that to uh, an inorganic standard control uh, a series of plots, and you compare um, simple regression equations to estimate the nutrient value. And we prepared the nutrient recommendations based on several years of trials under different environmental conditions. And um, they gave us values of the, the overall available nitrogen content. We did the same with phosphorus. The mineral nitrogen concentration, which was available from the analysis of the materials. And it also gave us the mineralizable content in terms of nitrogen release. Because the nitrogen availability of these materials is, is complicated. Because the nutrient value is derived from the inorganic concentration that's in the material, because crops can take that up straight away and also from the breakdown of the organic fraction which occurs in the soil environment. Now these materials uh, degrade at different rates depending on the type of process, so you need to be able to understand that mineralizable fraction. Now, um, I'll let you sort of uh, reflect on this uh, diagram or this picture just for a moment. And um, this, is the, uh, this is this is the ex-president of Egypt, uh, admiring um, which, what is one of the largest sewage treatment works in the world, Gabal Asfar, in, um, in Cairo. And uh, during the 80s and 90s, um, there was a massive infrastructure development program installing wastewater and sludge treatment for the greater Cairo uh, region. And when I was at WRC, my colleague and I, particularly led by Jeremy Hall, we bid for the Cairo Sludge Disposal Study Contract um, to develop uh, uh, safe and sustainable practices for the management of all the biosolids that was going to be generated from these treatment works, and we won the contract. So um, we had a very exciting time in the 90s and the early part of uh, 2000 doing this work. Cairo is producing about 0.4 million tonnes of sludge from this uh, uh, implementation, from full implementation. 
as, it, as is always the case with these materials, you have to be responsible, do it safely, it's got to be environmentally sustainable, and, but affordable. You've got to be able to afford to be able to do these things. You can always install lots of technology, but can you afford it? Can you, can you run these facilities? And when it boils down to it, there are three key options. Incineration, not a choice, too expensive, too complicated for Egypt. Landfill, well, there are landfills, but they're not really sustainable or um, secure, and it would be unacceptable to dispose of this material in landfill. So that left the agriculture option as the uh, main uh, driver. So this is the dream team. Um, this is Jeremy. Um, who led the project, and I was the environmental scientist on the team, so I was responsible for developing the field trials program and the interpretation and analysis of, of the data that were generated by that uh, program. And uh, I've never been a very fashion-conscious sort of guy. <laughs> so. Mustard is definitely not in this year. Yeah. So we set up, when I look back, a very ambitious program of research. We had a local team of about 100 um, uh, labourers and uh, local scientists supporting the project, and Jeremy and I really oversaw the whole thing, uh, both here and when we were in, in Egypt. And we, we visited Egypt several, several times a year for, for several weeks at a time. And um, th these uh, blue dots here are the uh, sewage uh, treatment works. And um, I can actually remember the names of them, but uh, I, I won't bore you with that. Um, and, and these stars here are the field trial sites. And, um, and overall, we had what was effectively a small farm's worth of, um, uh, of uh, trials ongoing throughout what was effectively a four-year programme. We looked at all of the operational factors and management practices that you might expect. So I don't think there are really any surprises in terms of sludge types, the rates of application, different types of irrigation, different soil types. But it was, very, it was critical for us to incorporate both the delta soils, which are traditionally high fertile soils, but as a result of the Nile deluge, but as a, res, as a consequence of the construction of the Aswan Dam, of course, this is controlled and doesn't happen anymore. And what's happening in the Nile Delta is the soil fertility is actually declining and there are significant trace element deficiencies occurring in those soils. And local communities who grow all of their own food have to take dietary supplements in order to um, correct those deficiencies. So biosolids application could contribute to correcting some of those problems. And um, a similar type of approach to the early work. Um, we have an inorganic response, a, a biosolid response, and we compare the relationships now, of course, it's a lot warmer in Egypt than it is here in, in northern Europe, in the UK. And not surprisingly, the nutrient value of the materials are correspondingly higher. So you know, this is very important because it means you can't take evidence from one region and necessarily apply it to another. And I have to say that um, uh, this, this was the largest programme of research on biosolids recycling in an arid region. And, um, and, and this was the first really substantive quantitative evidence that was generated by this type of research program. And all of the data that we've produced in these uh, experimental programs have fed into policy documents or advisory, government advisory information. Uh, for example, the recent uh, RB209, the Fertiliser Manual, incorporates... The, the advice information in there incorporates the results from our field trials research. And we also produced a, uh, a guidance document for the Cairo Wastewater Organisation and the Cairo General Organisation for Sanitary Drainage, affectionately called C. Gossard, and, uh, which is available in Egypt if you ever happen to be passing that way and you're interested. <laughs> so this information is all available. Okay, so that's one of the positive aspects that I want to look at. When you're dealing with these materials, it is necessary to, to be, take a responsible approach. We have to recognise that there are uh, potential hazards associated with them, and, um, and these require understanding of their behaviour in the environment, and uh, in some circumstances, 
uh, regulatory controls need to be applied so that they can be used safely and with confidence. And this is certainly the case with a group of elements known as heavy metals, for instance, zinc, copper, nickel, cadmium, all of which um, in excessive concentrations can have negative effects on the environment, including uh, plant growth. It's, a well -known, uh, it, it's well known that elevating metals in soils will result in phytotoxicity and reduce yields. Um, they can have food chain implications, impact human health, soil fertility. So you have statutory controls. In the UK, we have statutory limit values to uh, control these problems. However, there has been a very dramatic decline in concentrations. And I think this has a, a very significant impact on the way we undertake the risk assessment and understanding the chemistry of these materials in the environment. And I think this is a point that is being missed by the government in developing um, new standards and revising the standards that are being proposed currently for uh, biosolids and other materials. This, uh, this table illustrates the heavy metal concentration limits that are uh, uh, stipulated in Europe, in the European Directive. And these have been adopted in the UK. We have maximum limit values here. And the Environment Agency um, recently uh, set up a consultation proposing a range of new uh, revised standards for uh, these elements based on risk assessment. We responded to this consultation and really couldn't believe what we were seeing because as far as I was concerned, the output from this risk assessment didn't appear to bear any resemblance to my understanding of the scientific evidence over, over many, many years and my own research and that of my colleagues at, at WRC. And one can see that these concentrations are significantly lower than the current statutory values. It, I think it uh, has more serious implications than that because um, in Europe and in the UK at the moment, we're moving away to, uh, to a situation where we're deregulating waste materials, where wastes are being redefined as products. And so that, that releases them from the burden of uh, statutory controls and licensing and, and all the costs and implications associated with that. And in order to achieve deregulation of, of composted materials, um, the Composting Association and RAP developed a set of values um, to, uh, for, for composted materials that are generated by source separation of, uh, of, uh, of feedstocks, i.e. green waste. Now, the thing is that the Environment Agency is saying, well, you know, we're concerned about these soil limits, and what we think is that these soil limits should become product limits. And that has, a huge, has huge implications. When you consider that the medium or the mean concentration of zinc, for example, in high-quality source-separated compost is 200 milligrams per kilogram of zinc, if you drop it to 140 or two, this means that 50% of all the source-separated deregulated compost would be reclassified as wastes. I think something's gone very wrong here, and we need to re-look at this. We need to have a debate and to discuss and get to the bottom of the, of the science of, of what's happening. I had an opportunity to have a bit of a look at this, and uh, I was involved in developing end-of-waste criteria for some biosolids products for a major... UK water utility, and I put together all of the evidence uh, that I could find, and this is just a sample of it, that um, uh, illustrated uh, concentrations where there was no effect observed on any sensitive environmental parameters. And I mean these values, I included some of my own work, by the way, here, uh, in, which was some work we did at, in WRC. I mean these values, we've had a value of 575 for zinc and and one for copper of 250. I think they could actually be higher, but if you take a very conservative view, then you know, the, the, the current proposals are much, much lower than that. And, and I think when you look at the science, they cannot be justified. And I think it's a question of interpreting the outputs from risk assessment. Risk assessment is a tool, but you have to take an intelligent view on interpreting those results. You can only do it objectively. You can't take it as an absolute answer. And I think there, there is a problem there in terms of that interpretation. I've, well, this is what I think is happening. I think that if you take low and high metal materials 
um, they have very different chemistries. And low metal material, the metal availability, the bit that's going to be toxic, is very, very much smaller because of all the binding processes that take place compared to a high metal material. And in, when, you, when you undertake ecotoxological research, you define an upper critical concentration where there might be a problem if you exceed that value. And I think where you have high metal materials, it's perfectly reasonable to set a limit on the accumulation of total metals in soil uh, and set a limit value in order to protect the environment. However, if you have a low metal material, you can apply this material forever. And, and even if the material contains apparently more zinc than your soil limit, because of the chemistry, it will never exceed that critical upper value. So I think we need to take account of the properties of the products as well. It's not just about soil concentration, and I think it's getting more critical. This is a more critical argument as the concentrations of metals in these materials decline. I think the properties of the materials have a major controlling effect on this process, and that's not being taken account in these assessments. We need investment in research to get a better understanding of that. Okay, um, back to research that I've been doing recently, and, um, and, and a much more acute uh, problem is associated with um, the uh, pathogen content that may be present in bio-waste. Any bio-waste that contain feces there is a risk that it will um, also support a population of organisms that can cause enteric infectious diseases. And there's a whole list of these. There are, it's, a fa it's fascinating. The life cycles of some of these organisms are, are totally fascinating. And, um, and they're highly adapted to uh, an enteroparasitic lifestyle, many of them. So uh, they're, 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 they're very highly evolved organisms. But if we, these are being recycled to land, then it's clearly unacceptable for these materials to place human health at risk. So there's a need to impose what we call barriers to the transmission of these disease organisms. And there are a couple of strategies to do that. The multi-barrier approach to me is actually the most interesting and it applies to the main types of biosolids that are produced in the UK and Europe and that's the digestive products. Digestion occurs at 30, 35 degrees C Body temperature is 37 degrees C. There's not really much of a, a temperature inactivation challenge there. So um, you, you do find um, uh, residual numbers of pathogens potentially in these materials. So the strategy involves a multi-barrier approach, treatment to stabilize the material so that it makes it less attractive for pathogens to grow, and um, land use restrictions so you take advantage of the natural attenuation that takes place when you put human enteric pathogens into the environment. They don't survive or they lose viability over a period of time. But you've got to understand what those processes are and how long it takes for that to, to happen in order to define the, uh, the standards. And these materials are called Class B or conventionally treated. The single barrier, I won't deal, dwell on this too much, this means you treat the material to inactivate pathogens so it can be used without restriction. Um, the disadvantage of this is that it costs a lot more to do. You usually have to put more energy into it and, uh, and this sort of thing. So there can be advantages you know, in terms of uh, product uh, generation. Actually, I've got a few examples of products here if you're interested. Um, produces some great products, but it's more expensive. Um, and the point that I should uh, refer to is that the water industry supported a program in, in, in the reclassification of microbiological standards. The water industry supported a program of research to uh, redefine methods of measurement of pathogens in these difficult materials. Enumerating pathogens in an organic matrix is an extremely difficult thing to do, so we needed new methods. It also invested in a research program to assess the reduction in pathogen numbers during the treatment processes. But Paul Gale, who completed a risk assessment of uh, pathogen exposure from land application of biosolids, uh, he did incidentally show that um, the risks to health in the UK from land application of conventional biosolids was one in 14 million years. So if you're the guy who gets infected, you're just jolly unlucky. <laughs> um, 
but he also said that we need more information on the long-term pathogen removal that takes place in the soil. This is where we got the call. And we set up a program of research to investigate these inactivation mechanisms. Now, the microbiological quality of biosolids reflects the general health of the population. We're all pretty healthy. Few, of, if any of us, will have any um, enteric infections. And as a consequence, you can't find these organisms in biosolids as a, as a rule. And so in order to do this type of research, you have to inoculate with environmental strains of the pathogens in order to bump up the concentrations so you can actually measure the decay and, and measure their properties. So, um, and, and this is why we're wearing all these, uh, uh, these rubbers. We actually have to make the sludge hazardous to be able to do this research. And as a consequence, we, um, we have these uh, biological suits on. It's actually completely benign, actually. We make it hazardous. And when you do the measurements, we, we measured um, behavior in a couple of soil types. Um, and we found that decay occurred relatively rapidly. We bumped up the numbers of pathogens to an exceptionally high number um, of, of the order of uh, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 8, or 10 to the 10 organisms in the biosolids. Usually, you'll find 100 per gram. And when you add that 100 per gram to soil, it's diluted and you can't find them. So we bumped up the numbers massively. And we found that the organisms were uh, you know, completely uh, gone or <laughs> below the detection limit um, within about six months with a massive dose rate. If you add only 100 or so to the soil, then they, they disappear within a period of, of, of 20 days or so. So this work demonstrated, compared to the waiting periods that are required for growing sensitive crops like salads, requires a 30-month waiting period, that the, uh, those waiting periods are, ex uh, uh, are very, very safe, very large margins of safety built into those standards. But this is Imperial College, and we're not just happy about saying, yes, it's all safe. We wanted to know what the mechanisms were. And so from, from earlier work and from a literature review, uh, we identified a process of predation as being a key ecological mechanism that was taking place in the soil environment that was responsible for this inactivation. There are also other mechanisms as well which may be playing a role, but this predation activity seemed to be the most important. And I've got a video here just to show you what I mean. Um, and uh, this, this is a predatory organism. This is the sort of the lion of the soil world. If you were, um, if you, if you were on the savanna, you know, um, this is the sort of equivalent thing if you, if you were microorganisms in the soil. And basically, it's a, it's a, a very simple amoeba and there are different types of protozoa, but you can see this organism engulfing the bacteria cells here. This is a process... Oh, I don't know whether you got that. <laughs> we, we put a little burp in there. Right, let me stop that. Um, so this organism will consume, believe it or not, that but 10,000 bacteria a day. They're voracious feeders. And, um, and so these organisms... Uh, consume bacterial biomass, they're present in uh, uh, biosolids, they're present in, in soil, and uh, they have a major contribution to inactivating these organisms. Essentially, it's a self-controlling process. Now, measuring protozoa in soil is incredibly difficult. It's bad enough trying to measure pathogens. Measuring protozoa is incredibly difficult. And we developed a, uh, a, a technique, a bioluminescent technique, in order to be able to count the numbers of organisms. And this was the work of my student, helped with uh, Mike Rogers, who was the RA working with at the time, developed an assay where uh, we uh, labelled a plasmid, or we transferred a, a luminescent plasmid into a food organism. In this case, it was E. coli, or Escherichia coli. And so all these cells, which were luminescing here under UV light, um, they contain the food which the protozoa will ultimately uh, graze on. Now, um, we introduce a soil extract to these little wells. This is a little micro titer plate, so it's a sort of a micro technique, so you can do lots of them. And where the illuminescence is lost, where, where there is no light, then these show that the cells contain protozoa. Okay? 
and uh, you carry out a dilution series across the plate and uh, the frequency of positives and negatives on this plate, you can use uh, probability tables to calculate how many uh, protozoa cells are present in the original sample. So this meant we could screen large numbers of samples and, and, and undertake statistically robust uh, experimental analysis compared to the traditional way, which is sort of peering down a microscope, which is extremely laborious, very bad on the eyesight, and actually hardly provides you with any data whatsoever. So this really did streamline the, the, the overall process. And what we found was really incredible. And, um, and when you're testing a hypothesis, and you see that your hypothesis is actually coming true, and it's very, very exciting, and what we found were massive increases in the numbers of protozoa very, very quickly when you're adding biosolids into the soil environment. And that's reflected in these blue and red lines here. These are two different biosolids types. This is the background numbers in the population in the soil. So you get this very large peak in numbers, which actually corresponded with the period of rapid decay of uh, the enteric bacteria that we observed um, from the uh, ba ba bacteriological measurements. And then you get this uh, uh, period afterwards where numbers decline, but they remain at a higher level. It's as if the soil has a memory effect. It remembers you've put in lots of biomass and organic resources. So it sort of preconditioned it. So the next time you put pathogens in there, it'd actually be even more effective at knocking them out. So I think this was a very, very exciting uh, set of results. And we took it further to try and elucidate these processes uh, in more detail, field you need field experiments. You need to be able to understand these processes in the real world, the real environment. But the problem is in the real world is that lots of things are co correlated together and you can't always differentiate the, uh, the main factors that influence um, the, the end point that you're interested in. And laboratory experiments allow you to do that where you can control a whole range of factors and, and change a variable and assess the impact of that variable on, um, uh, on, on the behavior. So in this experiment, we had sterile and non-sterile soils. Um, we added biosolids, which were sterile and non-sterile. And um, we had positive and negative controls. E. coli was the bacteria indicator that we used to measure the impacts of protozoa. And we found that over a period of time, in the soil, which was amended with the digested sludge, then the uh, bacteria decayed. And we did find that there were protozoa active in this fresh environment, as you'd expect. What was very exciting was that in the sterile soil, although it wasn't quite as responsive as the fresh soil, the unsterile soil, we also showed a de decline in the indicator bacteria under those conditions. So this is a sterile soil, so if there are any predators then those predators must be coming in with the, uh, with the biosolids. And lo and behold, there they were. So the biosolids itself contain um, encysted protozoa. They survive the anaerobic digestion process. They're actually coming in, probably, from the biological wastewater treatment process, where they are uh, present in very significant numbers and are part of the, bio the uh, community involved in biological wastewater treatment. So this is... In direct evidence, I think, of their role. And what we're looking for is support to be able to continue with this uh, very exciting and relevant research. Just pop back uh, momentarily to Egypt. Conditions there are very different to those in a um, European or North American managed agricultural situation. And um, here you'd need to apply a single barrier approach in order to protect the farmers and the consumers of crops, you can't necessarily guarantee how the material is going to be used. So a multi-barrier approach won't work here. You have to apply a single barrier. So treatment in order to eliminate pathogens so it can be used safely. Composting is very, very effective at eliminating pathogens and still produces a useful product. And storage and uh, uh, desiccation are also other techniques. So these were part of the management practices that we incorporated in our guidance in the Cairo Sludge Disposal Study. Um, in 2006, I had the, you know, the, the very exciting opportunity of giving a keynote paper to the Australian Water Association on, uh, to their biosolids conference. And ever since, I've been popping back 
uh, perhaps up to two times, twice a year, advising uh, the water industry and the waste management industry on uh, bioresource recycling to agricultural land. And um, the biosolids um, industry uh, is very uh, buoyant, is very proactive in Australia, and there is a well-developed agricultural recycling activity taking place in, in the country. Uh, New South Wales uh, recycles more or less all of its biosolids. Queensland also, and uh, Western Australia has also got very active recycling programs. The, the state which sort of stands out like a sore thumb is Victoria. And um, Victoria really has been stockpiling sludge on its treatment works sort of ever since it can remember. And uh, some of these treatment works are pretty big, I have to say, 11,000 hectares, pretty big treatment works. You can't really see the, the end of the, you know, the perimeter of the treatment works. This represents almost a quarter of the total production of biosolids in Australia. They're about two, just over two million tonnes. They don't really know how much is stockpiled, but it's probably about two million tonnes. And um, nearly all of this is at two major metropolitan wastewater treatment works, uh, the Eastern Treatment Plant and the Western Treatment Plant. So um, I, I was, uh, after the 2006 conference, I, I was invited to collaborate on a proposal and write the technical specification to the Smart Water Fund on a proposal in order to uh, evaluate the microbiological quality of these materials. Because uh, the, uh, the state regulator had set very, very stringent controls which were essentially preventing this material going to agricultural land. And um, so uh, uh, we, we wrote the proposal, we won the research, and um, we've been working with the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology who are the, the main contractor for the work, and I'm uh, sort of an advisor to the project, in order to evaluate the microbiological properties of these materials. And um, the, um, this isn't rocket science, but uh, basically uh, di digested biosolids are pumped into lagoons where they're air dried because it's quite a nice climate. It makes sense to use, make you know, use of the climate. And then after the material dries and can be piled, it's sort of formed into um, windrows like this. Uh, but there's this three-year stockpiling requirement. And um, this is a material, uh, this is uh, a couple of years ago. This material had been sort of stockpiled for several years at the point when we were sort of sampling this material. And um, just to give you an idea of scale, um, this little blob here is, is me. And... Um, these stockpiles, they're, they're given names, and actually you can have a mountain of sludge named after you. So um, that, that's one of my ambitions in life, to be called Mount Smith in, uh, in the state of Victoria. I think that would be absolutely would be f fabulous. Um, so just very quickly, just to sort of illustrate the data, um, we've been working with uh, RMIT sampling these uh, systems in the field and measuring decay. And what we find, as we would have expected, is that the decay of these organisms is extremely effective under these conditions. This reflects sorts of practices that we've observed here in Europe. And um, it's meeting their most stringent uh, uh, microbiological standards well before the material is lifted for stockpiling. So it makes no sense whatsoever to have a three-year stockpile put on the end. And, and actually, that is even... Is, is intended to protect human health, but it's actually having a much greater impact on the environment because the nitrogen concentrations in these materials crash because basically it's mineralizing and then being denitrified and lost as nitrous oxide. So I think you know, it's actually having a deleterious effect. The intention to protect health is actually having a deleterious effect on the environment. Um, I mean, I've been working with Margaret Dayton's group in the School of Applied Sciences and uh, RMIT uh, seized the opportunity with this research and our collaboration and invested, I think, the best part of $200,000 in equipping and building a bespoke environmental microbi microbiology laboratory for us to do this and related types of work. So I think our relationship will be going on for hopefully many years to come. And, and this, is the, this is the facility. 
We've been verifying. The, the standards require verification of processes with pathogens. You can't add pathogens. Similarly in the UK, the Australian community is actually quite healthy. There are no pathogens in the sludge. But they require verification with some very, very stubborn pathogens. So you have to inoculate them into the material, but then conduct carefully controlled laboratory experiments that simulate the conditions in the field. And so we have these tanks that we add the biosolids into. We simulate the temperature and the, de the drying profile. And we put the pathogens in these little chambers, these little sentinel chambers. This is, all the, this is the dry stuff at the end of the, the drying period. And we measure the decay of, of the organisms. This work is ongoing. And um, you know, we've, we're looking at a range of organisms. And, and publications are now coming out of this work. OK. I'm, I'm sort of in the last chapter of the, of the talk. And I'm just about OK for time. OK, um, biodegradable waste come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And I think one of the most challenging types of biodegradable waste to deal with is that of municipal solid waste uh, that contains a very large fraction of food waste and garden waste and biodegradable waste and industrial and commercial waste. Now, these represent a challenge because of the sources of the materials. They're all mixed together with other stuff which can be valuable, glass, uh, plastic, ferrous and non-ferrous metals. And so you have these complex mixtures to deal with. So there's a need to sort of separate out these materials in order to capture different types of material in order to uh, derive value from them. So I think this type of waste is a particular challenge. Um, there are measures to... Um, they're, they're, they're conventionally landfilled, of course, and, um, and there are measures, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, to reduce landfill disposal very significantly. And um, you know, one of the reasons for that is the anaerobic degradation of the materials release methane gas, which is 23 times more potent than CO2 as a, a greenhouse gas. And uh, landfill represents one of the largest anthropogenic sources of, of methane in the UK and Europe. And, and though um, the concentrations have declined uh, across the, uh, the waste industry as a result of the introduction of these measures, you know, they, they're still a significant share of the total. And we are still disposing of a lot of biodegradable waste in landfill. Now, the there are a range of regulations, um, bans on things, you know, reducing l limits to various thresholds, um, targets, recycling targets, uh, uh, fiscal incentives, trading schemes. Um, but none of these things tell you how you should sort of go about doing it. And there's a whole range of scenarios that can be followed in order to um, derive value from waste and divert it from landfill. But in future, I mean, these controls only apply to municipal waste, household and municipal waste. They don't apply to industrial waste, but in future they could. So all biodegradable waste could ultimately become controlled by these types of measures. The different ways of doing it. Um, the first is that you can engage the community, which is obviously a very positive thing to do. You get the community to separate out the biodegradable waste and the glass and the plastic and all this sort of thing. And, and that sort of works moderately well, but there are still contamination problems with that. Um, another way is for homeowners, engage homeowners, to compost their biodegradable waste at home. And, um, there's been a lot of interest in the role of home composting and its role in diverting waste from landfill. And we, we've had two major projects um, funded by uh, landfill tax um, uh, in, in recent years to investigate the role, and it does make a significant contribution. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that. In my next inaugural, I'll include that um, <laughs> topic. Um, no, there'll never be another one. <laughs> Um, incineration, I mentioned about that. Centralised composting and uh, anaerobic digestion. Uh, uh, Centralised composting, as I mentioned, has really expanded hu hugely over the last uh, 10 years or so. Anaerobic digestion, I think we're going to see an expansion. This is really favoured by government. We are going to see an expansion in anaerobic digestion. Maybe not to the same level, 
as um, as compost. But I think these materials will these technologies will take up some of the food waste, for example, that's uh, available. But um, the, the technology that I'm particularly interested in is this one, mechanical biological treatment linked to pyrolysis and gasification. I think there are really major opportunities to be had from, from the link, the integration of these two technologies. What is mechanical biological treatment? Well, this involves collecting whole waste. So you don't trouble the community to separate their waste. Allow them to put it in the bin and you collect all of the waste together. And you can do that actually very efficiently compared to separate waste collections. And then you have a treatment process that will separate the different types of waste. And those take treatment technologies, the materials handling um, technologies are extremely advanced now. It's possible now to separate even different types of plastics based on their optical density. So, so you know, this is, these technologies are extremely advanced and capable of doing the job, probably more so than allowing homeowners to do it, in my view. And then you have a biological part, <coughs> and that uh, involves a stabilisation process. It could be anaerobic digestion or composting uh, these residues. But the technology I'm particularly interested in is using uh, microbiological heat, metabolic heat, which is generated in a process similar to composting, but harnessing that heat to dry the material um, so that it uh, converts it into a high calorific fuel. And that material can provide an ideal, our thinking is that that material can provide an ideal feedstock into pyrolysis and gasification, which is very sensitive <coughs> to uh, feedstock variability and moisture content. And I think the integration of these two technologies offers great opportunities for the future. Um, a, a number of years ago, actually based on the work I was doing in, in Egypt, um, uh, uh, which included a, a, um, a British Council uh, link project, and the environment consultant from the British Council came out to see what we're doing. A few, few weeks later, I got the phone call, would you like to go out and give a talk in Cyprus? So I thought, that sounds, that sounds good. So I went out and gave a talk on waste management in Cyprus, and I was suggesting that perhaps in Cyprus, which has only really got one major industry, and that's the cement works, and that they use the cement works um, as a, uh, a thermal combustion process, so deriving benefit from wastes in terms of their calorific value, reducing energy imports to the island, and it's a sort of a win-win-win situation. And um, uh, one of the technical directors of the Vasilico Cement Works said, would you like to come and act as a consultant for us? So, um, and, and in doing so, I met a chap, Peter Hood, who's here in the audience, and um, who'd developed a, a concept of utilizing this metabolic heat in a rotary biodryer, uh, very similar to a, a, a rotary composting uh, system. Now, I've always thought that rotary composting was, was uh, really a, a, a nonsense because composting is a process that takes many, many weeks to complete and the retention time in the rotary phase of the process is only a few days. So it only really acts as a preconditioning to the overall composting action. However, the idea of harnessing the heat in an enclosed vessel and then using that heat to drive off the moisture I could see, and I got very excited about, and I fell in love with the concept immediately. And um, at the time, I had a really good MSc student from the Environmental M Engineering MSc course in the department. And he wanted to do a PhD with me. He was a Cypriot chap. He knew where there was a small scale, or industrial scale, rotary composter that we could convert. And we applied for research funding from the uh, Cyprus Research Promotion Foundation. We got the funding, and so off we went. And we cited this drum, which you can see here, at the Vasilico Cement Works, and embarked on a program of research to optimise the thermodynamics of the process. So it was all, all coming together of lots of different uh, factors to, uh, to make this one work. This is the, the feedstock. Basically, we used a surrogate feedstock MSW is a very heterogeneous material. It's very, very difficult to handle. Um, you, you, you can have difficulties getting hold of it, surprisingly enough. Very variable, really unsuitable for controlled, robust experimental work. 
Now, just up the road from the Vasilico Cement Works is the largest concentration of fish restaurants in Cyprus. Uh, there's a little village called Ziggy, and uh, my students was well connected, as everybody's well connected with everybody else in Cyprus, and we set up an arrangement where we'd collect food waste every week, and then we'd use that and modify it by adding other materials so we could produce a controlled surrogate MSW for the trial. So we had consistent feedstock over the three years of the trials. And this is the input. This is, it's been in the, in the drum for uh, probably a few hours, and you can see uh, here's the, the lemon peel, we've got some paper here, and, and it's really pretty awful stuff, and it smells. <laughs> MSW smells, it really is. Now, temperature is critical to controlling this process, and um, intuitively you'd think high temperatures would be best, and, um, but actually that's not the case. Um, high temperatures, the process becomes unstable. The thermophilic organisms are very pH sensitive, and um, because you have a, a large amount of readily biodegradable waste, a, a, a metabolic intermediate are volatile fatty acids, and so the pH can drop. In fact, this, this is almost akin to you know, pickling in, in vinegar, you know, and, and the process collapses. So, um, and, and this is what's sort of happening here. We've got process collapse, and it, and, and it takes ages to recover because the VFAs have to volatilize and be slowly metabolized. And so it can take days, if not a week or two, for the operation to, uh, to work correctly. So we found operating at a lower temperature range between 30 and 50 degrees C, and you can see here's the hysteresis. And what we have is a heating and cooling cycle. Now these are really important. The low temperature is important because it means you're blowing more air through the process. And in doing that, you're actually, you've got a larger number of uh, void replacements, you're actually moving air which contains water vapour out of the chamber more frequently and therefore it dries more readily than in a, in a higher temperature system which requires less air. But the other thing about the heating cycle and controlling the humidity in the drum is that during this heating phase, when you've only just got a, a background level of air blowing through the process in order to maintain aerobic conditions, um, you're also maintaining supersaturated moisture vapour in the chamber. And this means that the microorganisms which are living on the surface, surfaces of the particles, though the average moisture content of the particle may be limiting to microbial activity, they're actually living in a, in a moist environment and so are able to maintain metabolic activity and temperature elevation at much lower moisture contents that's possible with conventional static systems which you can buy off the shelf from various technology providers. And I think that is the key, one of the key innovations of this technology. It means you can dry microbially at very low moisture contents, which you can't do by static systems, which is you can buy a static system off the shelf. Now, this means you can dry a lot quicker and under the, the uh, optimum temperature regime, you know, we were, this was the fastest drying rate now, if you're speeding the drying rate, we can dry this material in three days compared to the conventional static system, which can take maybe two weeks, 10 days to two weeks or so. That has a huge impact on the size of plant and the capital costs. About this, the cost of a facility based on this technology will be about a third of currently available systems. So it has a huge, huge advantage. Drying the material rapidly, means you're consuming less of the biodegradable material, the energy, the fuel that microorganisms are using. So consequently, the calorific value of the fuel is so much higher. So that's another, another benefit. And um, we found that under optimum conditions, we could dry the waste within three days. And this is a sample. This is the same sample that went in at the front end. It's a dry, very attractive, uh, odour-free. Not, not unpleasant, it doesn't have, it's not odour-free, but... Um, it's actually got a, quite a sweet, um, you know, quite a perfumey sort of smell. <laughs> now, Vasilico, we're really interested in the technology, and um, because they're uh, a heavy uh, energy user in Cyprus, and uh, they're interested in uh, alternative auxiliary fuels and how they can, you know, uh, be much more efficient in, in terms of their carbon footprint, and so they funded and supported a full-scale industrial trial, and this is a team of um, pickers from Eastern European people who sort of arrived suddenly from nowhere. 
and uh, they're on a picking belt, so they're taking out sort of non-degradable material. And um, hello, this one's saying hi. And uh, it's being prepared for feeding into the, um, the kiln. Now, they, Vasilico has a number of redundant cement kilns sort of ha literally hanging around in the factory. And uh, they converted a 14-metre kiln into a full-scale biodryer. And we operated this for three months, provide sufficient quantities of fuel that they could do controlled burn trials. And they found that the fuel quality was superior to many other types of auxiliary fuel, including refuse-derived fuel, which is uh, a mechanically sorted material with all the biodegradable fraction taken out. So it had real, really superior properties. And this is a sample of the, the fuel from the industrial scale biodryer. So to sum up 30 years in a slide, what does this all mean? Um, recycling. Um, we need to recycle all of these bioresources. Th those bioresources um, where it's economically viable and practicable to do, we need to be recycling them to land um, so that nutrient cycles can be complete. And if we don't do that, there is going to be a big problem. Okay? We need to do that. Contaminants. We don't really want contaminants in bioresources. They're there for all sorts of reasons. The concentrations are falling. We have a very good understanding of the science and the impacts of these things in soils and in the environment. We still need to get them out of the system as much as possible. Um, but I, I think in order to avoid unnecessary restrictions on maximising this recycling opportunity, we need more research on the behaviour and the chemistry of metals in low metal materials so we don't make some bad mistakes in setting unnecessary limit values and, and restricting uses unnecessarily. Pathogens, we've got a good understanding of, about pathogen behaviour and how effective treatment and land use restrictions are. Um, this is, a, in, 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 in relation to biosolids, this is a self-limiting process. The biosolids intrinsically is self-limiting to the pathogens it contains when you put the material onto the soil. So that's a very positive message. But there are some groups of organisms where the technologies to understand their behaviour are only really just coming available in terms of modern molecular techniques. Viruses, we need to understand the behaviour of those organisms more. So I'd like to do something like I've just des described to you this evening on viruses and uh, also to study these ecological processes in more detail. There are some materials where even I have to admit they're not suitable for land application. It's too expensive, you know, they, they, uh, it's, it's not practicable necessarily to recycle these to land, but it doesn't mean to say we can't derive value from them and we can use their intrinsic microbiological pro properties to dry the material, to produce fuels and recover calorific value from the carbon that is trapped or captured by photosynthesis when these food materials and biomass bio materials were laid down in the first place. And that we, can, we have the technology to do that now. And uh, if we were to do this, um, then th there is no reason why we couldn't reduce the landfill disposal of municipal waste and commercial industrial waste to 10 to 20 percent of the levels that we're currently doing. And we've got the technology, we have the know-how, we can do that now. And so, you know, what are we waiting for? Thank you. <laughs>